All right, so I think I'm gonna uh, go ahead and get started. And I think that's, uh, there's one more person coming, but we'll go ahead and get started and you can walk past me. Um, so this is a library that I created as part of my uh, thesis a long time ago. Um, it was a work that was probably four or five years in creation, something I still play with, you know, lunch breaks, nights, weekends, all the time. Cause it's just something I care about a lot, something that interests me and something I think that, you know, we need as a uh, community. Before I go too much further though, my day job. So I'm an employee of ARM Research. Um, this is not an ARM product. I'm not gonna talk about ARM Research. I'm not gonna talk about ARM product line um, or anything else ARM associated. So please keep the questions related to the library and associated works. And a brief word from our sponsors, which currently my only sponsor is Caffeine. Um, <laughs> former sponsors were NSF, few companies at the bottom, my uh, university, um, which funded most of the initial development and research that went into this uh, library. Um, I also like to thank these uh, guys, Fair Pixels, because, well, they provided me a nice, snazzy new logo, which is, um, well, <laughs> far sight better than uh, what's on the left there. And, you know, I think on GitHub, this uh, new logo probably got me at least like 200 stars um, just because of that. All right, so what is it? So a lot of the presentations I've gone to, I have gotten about 30 slides in, I have no idea what they're actually presenting. So Raftlib is at its core, not just a threading library, because that'd be a misnomer. It's an asynchronous programming library. So we're talking anything that is out of order. I wanna be able to arrange a program that can run on threads, processes, fibers, and heterogeneous accelerators just the same. We'll get into exactly how we do that. It's a header library, but it's also a compiled library, because as you might imagine, in something like this, there's a lot of backend code that, well, it's a far state faster at compile time if it's already compiled and I can just link it in. Um, it enables programmers to, you know, think about just the computation. And when I want to hook, you know, an application together and assemble it from lots of smaller kernels, the core of this library and the chief innovation, which I think is cool, which actually wasn't even in the original library, is this uh, embedded DSL, which um, uses uh, C++ templates and overloads a lot of stuff, which, well, some people might find offensive, and you can tell me when we get to that point. Um, lastly, so I know the current version, or at least the mainline branch, runs on OS X. We got Linux, we got Unix. Theoretically, it runs on Windows 10. I just pushed another patch, and my Windows 10 box is down. Um, eventually, I'm going to run to the cloud for um, integration for my Windows stuff, but, yeah. Not yet, so theoretically it works on Windows 10, maybe not, we'll find out if anybody wants to download and compile it while I'm talking, you can uh, sharpshoot me at the end. All right, so the obligatory outline slide, I'm not gonna talk about my outline because you guys can read that. So we're gonna start off some introduction stuff and then get into the meat and hopefully get into some interaction towards the end. All right, so motivation. So back when I started programming, I was using a Commodore 64, obviously one core. Um, Back in the you know, mid-90s, we started getting multiple sockets you know, in a lot of places. Still single you know, core per socket most of the time. Um, then we started up with uh, dual cores. Now we're talking 128 to um, you know, plus cores per socket. That's an insane amount of complexity to deal with. And I don't think most of our current programming models and paradigms actually fit that. How many people regularly program with threads on something that's 128 cores? or even 48 cores. Excuse me, 48 cores are kind of common. All right, how, how do you like it? <laughs> exactly, that, that was my thought. And I, I now get, you know, have the privilege of working with a lot of systems that are you know, 48 core, 96 core um, test systems and programming it with current paradigms like OpenMP, pthreads, I get lost in the code, I get lost in the memory allocations, I get lost in um, all the FIFOs that go from one place to the next. It's a big, huge mess. All right, so yet more complexity. So we've gone from DDR to DDR plus non-volatiles, which those add very interesting and strange characteristics to our memory access times. And now we're adding even more memory types. Now we have high, or high bandwidth memory. We have uh, oh, hybrid memory cubes for HMC and Micron's product. Um, those have very definite characteristics. And we have to take those into account if we actually want maximum performance. We have to know where to place the data. How many people know what APIs to use to place data between one device and another? I know the uh, most ubiquitous one's probably the MCD RAM for uh, k &L boards, but okay, I got one hand. <laughs> most people don't know how to place data from one memory type to the next. 
Um, and that's actually critical for getting the performance that we actually expect out of these devices. And right now, hardware manufacturers um, expect us to do this manually. Uh, with the exception of, say, like the OpenMP TR that's theoretically coming out, I hope, which has hints for placement. Um, we're not going to talk about that today. Uh, and lastly, for various performance reasons, we're adding more and more caches. So I'm, I'm assuming everyone knows what a cache does, right? Okay. So when we start adding in more and more levels of cache, that's great for things that have um, what we call um, data reuse. So if you're looking at the same piece of data over and over and over within a certain range, I can cache that and I can get extremely low latency within that range of data. And so that's perfect. But the problem is when I start adding all these different caches and lots of different threads, I get weird interactions that I wasn't necessarily expecting. And I get you know, even more complexity added on, which ostensibly this runs you know, a benchmark like specint great. Um, but if I want to run you know, a real application, it's not going to run as expected. Um, so I'm seeing all these things that are trends that are kind of coming together and I don't think we actually have a solution as a programmer community for you know, the problem that will soon, unfortunately, ail us. And to make matters worse, you know, I show all these cores here. So what happens when we start adding GPUs? I've seen a few GPU um, related talks. And then what happens when we throw in FPGAs? Um, I don't think we have the necessary constructs, and I'm not saying Raftlib is necessarily a perfect one for that either. It's a solution I'm proposing. But I don't think we actually have the necessary constructs to actually deal with what's coming within the next three or four or five years, at least from a ease of use perspective. If I hire an army of programmers, sure, we got it. No. And you know the trend I'm seeing is this, well, okay, background. I love historical computers, so I collect all kinds of random, a lot of people call junk. Um, but, you know, eBay provides us a source for getting all kinds of stuff. And so on a lot of these really old computers, you have to go back to what's called memory folding. And so I have to take my memory and fold it back to my storage device, fold it back to my memory device. And unfortunately, that's the paradigm I'm starting to see. And, you know, right, 68, 69, we started to get automatic folding devices, which evolved into what we have is virtual memory today. Um, but we're going back to this, and it's bad. We seem to, like, devolve back into the same old rut every like 40 or 50 years in various paradigms, and computing's now one of them. And this put and get model, you see it in CUDA. So CUDA mem copy to device, CUDA copy from device back to my host. Now we have unified virtual memory models that theoretically kind of you know, make those better. The problem is they're not universal like virtual memory. Virtual memory is basically you know, required of POSIX. POSIX, you know, if you look at POSIX and virtual memory, I have to have one and the other combined because the standard is built around the idea of virtual memory. Um, having a vendor locked solution for this pointer is a pointer idea, which essentially is what virtual memory is and gives us, um, is not a good thing. And I think long term, we need to go back from that, whether it's um, coming up with a new programming paradigm that actually hides all the complexities of moving data, um, which is in a sense what I've done, or whether it's coming up with a um, new standard of virtual memory, and that's, again, something I'm not going to talk about today. All right, so um, my background a long, long time ago was as a biologist. So I had dreams of sitting in labs and, you know, working my uh, auger plates all day long and coming up with cool new stuff. Uh, but then I got into computational biology and other things, and now here I am, but that's a side story. So we have one core, and that's one cell. So we have one cell. One cell can do some fun stuff. It's kind of interesting, right? You know, we have single-celled organisms. They kind of eat things, and yeah, not too terribly interesting, but they exist. You have multi-cell organisms. They're a little bit more interesting, but still, I like the four cells. Eh, they really don't do that much either. Then you add in a few more cells. And yeah, they're a little bit more complex, and really it's the interaction that makes the difference. And eventually we get the cats. Yeah, you know what, I had to throw in a cat slide. Um, <laughs> it's the interaction of the cells that actually make the cat. It's how these things work together to form the organism. And so you see the same things in uh, multi-core computers and heterogeneous uh, nodes. You see these you know, CPUs, you have these you know, what are systolic array processors like Google's TPU? You have GPUs, you have FPGAs, all of them sitting in one system and all trying to work together. But how many people think we have the glue to actually hook them all together effectively? 
Yeah, I'm not getting much response from the audience, okay. Um, so I don't think we have the glue to hook them all together effectively. And it's the interaction, say these cells, that what that hooks them together, that makes the cat. And so <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna find a better way to make cats. Oh, geez, I was hoping for more laughs. Okay, <laughs> got more laughs at the bad joke afterwards. So I wanna find a better way to make glue, to hook all the stuff that we put in these boxes together, make them all work together so we can get cats. All right, and so, yeah, I was supposed to click that one already. Um, but essentially, I don't think we're there. None of the paradigms we have so far, they're all independent, they're all vendor specific, and they're all paradigm specific. And so what we need is something new. All right, this is actually fortuitous, having Google with their uh, IO thing yesterday when their announcement for ML programming, since I already had the slide produced. So back in the 40s, uh, these ladies back here were um, operators on the ENIAC. Um, you know, you have switches and very manual programming paradigm. That's obviously not scalable. So they came up with uh, punch cards, which I often think we should go back to for teaching kids uh, sorting. Um, so with punch cards, it's a little more scalable. Great. Well, then we had an explosion of languages and you kind of jump from like here all the way up through like, you know, present day. Um, well, at supercomputing last year, I sat through this conference on cognitive computing and the, you know, the basic thesis was you know, we can just talk to our computers, like, uh, I don't know, Scotty on Star Trek, you know, computer, do this for me. Well, that's a great idea. Um, I, I don't think that's where we're at today, and I think that's probably at least 20 years off for very complex algorithms. Um, there's only so much you can do with statistical learning. So I would like to focus, you know, kind of what we can do here before we get to here, which is like the 2100, 2200 year phase. Um, and so that's where I'm going to, you know, focus the talk today. So motivation, one, productivity. I don't like to write you know, extra code that I don't have to. I don't like to write boilerplate code. I don't like to write the same thing over and over and over. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, today, the cost of just getting programmers, I mean, I don't wanna ask anyone's salaries, but I'm assuming it's between the 100 and $300,000 a year range, depending on you know, whatever currency you're in. Um, that's a lot of money. Today, computer hardware is a commodity resource. I can go to the cloud and get most of the hardware that 10 years ago, I would have had to spec out a data center. I would have had to get you know, resources, area, um, electrical uh, engineers in there to run extra power lines, extra transformers installed. Today, I can go to the cloud and get the same compute and I can rent it. I don't have to hire all the extra you know, you know, labor to do that for me. I don't have to go look for real estate to be able to do that. It's much simpler. And so the cost of what we're left with is the programmer, and the programmer provides the added value. And so making the most use out of the programmers that we have is critical. And to me, extra boilerplate code, yeah, <laughs> um, don't want to necessarily do that. Um, okay, and I really wanted this as a build slide, but yeah, I didn't do it. But the obligatory Moore's Law reference. Who thinks we can frequency scale and you know, process scale forever? And I know right now we're looking at like seven nanometer-ish and five nanometers. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen much past two because there's really not that many gains, at least in my opinion, to be made. Um, so really, essentially Moore's Law is dead. Um, I'll go ahead and you know, start shoveling the grave. Uh, so what do we do next? We have lots of silicon. We don't necessarily use it all, right? So what we're starting to do is add more functional accelerators, adding more vector units, adding more um, DMA engines. And what we're also starting to see are things like, uh, you know, they call them in the industry chiplets, but basically they're like chips that you hook together in various uh, pieces, parts. So they could be at different processes, and I guess that's the beauty of chiplets, because you can hook different technologies together. It's like Legos. Um, but what this provides us is a veter very heterogeneous multi-core chip that's very um, interesting to program. And it looks a lot like our node-level heterogeneous systems, but at a much smaller scale. But now we're gonna ask our programmers to now program it. Program these systems which have basically an FPGA, a GPU, and a massively multi-core processor all in the same socket. Sounds like a lot of fun, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Motivation, so boilerplate code. One of my favorite pieces of code I used to write, favorite, not really, because it was really just a vim, you know, cut paste, um, was scheduler affinity code. It's the same exact code every single time, but I mean, the API is written such that basically you have to write all this cruft 
every single time. I, mean, I just make a library out of it. I'm sure everyone else does too. But why didn't we design the API to be simpler and easier to use in the first place? The API is there. It's the same combination of code, basically, and the same error checking code. Um, you know, somebody pointed out to me this morning, on some Unix systems, if I have enough cores, I just have to keep calling the CPU set thing over and over and over until it throws an error, which is a wonderful design feature. <sighs> yeah. All right, so parallel programming. So I love the, you know, what we've done with the C++ 11 standard thread. So nothing against that. I mean, basically it's pthread create with a nicer wrap around it. It's all the same exact functionality, it's just with, you know, c -ized, um code. But in my mind, okay, so we'll step through this. So first problem. Here's the first problem. I say standard thread. So now what happens if I want to run the same thing in a process? Now I have to go write a separate fork code and go through all that. And that's a lot of extra cruft and stuff that I'm going to have to add on there manually. Okay, what happens if I want to do this in a fiber? Now I have to go redo my code yet again. I don't want to have to do that. Um, I don't know. How about a GPU? That's, I don't know, at least a thousand extra lines of code ordering on there with all the mem copies and stuff I've got to do. So I want to, you know, get rid of that and have a single representation. So that's the first thing. Um, second thing is these joins here. I don't necessarily need that either, um, especially with the paradigm I'm tell you about today because I know exactly when the producer is going to stop producing data. I know when the consumer is going to stop or receiving data. And so I know when I can start shutting things down, free up resources, and basically join the threads, fibers, processes, um, et cetera. And there's a long list there. Um, I don't need a lot of that extra code, so I can get rid of the cruft, which is kind of nice. Programmer productivity example. Um, yeah, so if I'm a small business and you know I'm consulting now for a few, uh, we have a few, you know, programmers, and the big guys. I mean, Google. They have armies of programmers. I mean, they actually interview more programmers in a day, more than likely, than many of these companies would hire in the whole existence of the company. That's that's a problem. They can just you know churn through code much faster than any small business can. So the idea of productivity is really not just about productivity and making programming easier. It's actually enabling innovation, enabling really at the bottom line increases in GDP. Um, through better productivity, faster coding, and better turnaround. It's enabling small businesses to be successful in an arena that typically requires larger, more experienced staffs that I couldn't necessarily afford. All right. So, yeah, miscellaneous stuff that came out of Q&A last time. Um, one, why did you do a library? Um, so, yeah, that's a long story. I started off writing a language, and I don't know how many people here are academics with students? Any, okay, so my advisor was basically, you know, hey, Jonathan, you're an idiot. Um, and he, he said a little bit nicer than that, but basically um, writing language, getting rid of all the reduce, reduce conflicts, and then, you know, that's pretty much a dead end for a thesis. You don't want to do that if you're a PhD. Um, afterwards, maybe in your spare time, great, but not while you're trying to uh, graduate, and especially if that's not your major um, contribution. So what I ended up doing was packaging up as a C++ library. And the reason being is because, well, lots of people use C++. It's easy to use. And um, templates, um, for better or for worse, lend themselves to creating um, domain-specific languages. And so if you're careful and you have enough time on your hands and you feel like reading lots of debug messages, um, C++ templates are one avenue for a DSL. And so that's, what I, that's the avenue I went. Um, lastly, I kind of started looking at you know, I originally started off in computer science wanting to look at HCI. And so I like how humans interact with their computer. Languages, to me, are that interaction. So languages are another aspect of HCI in my mind. And that's, I think, one thing we all often miss when we start producing these cool language constructs. And I started to put this on the slide. But we build these language constructs for computer scientists, not humans. And... <laughs> And I realized this when I went out into the world and started teaching people stuff and trying to get them to realize, you know, this crazy complex recursive template that I thought was super awesome. And they're like, what? Um, just give me a for loop. Um, so, yeah, we need to start looking at all these, you know, libraries and all these language constructs, not just through our eyes, experienced C++ programmers, but through, you know, the eyes of the novice user if we actually want to keep gaining adoption. I mean, it's my, you know, two cents. And I went ahead and uh, felt big and threw myself in a nice quote box um, just because I can. And so, yeah, HCI as a you know aspect of language, 
kind of needs to be adopted, in my opinion. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that one? I mean, I've got a little bit of time. No thoughts on languages as human computer interaction? Wow, dead audience. <laughs> <laughs> That that is one. Well, okay. We'll we'll stay. <laughs> that is one reason, perhaps. Yes, um, I think that's one reason Scala perhaps is very popular because you can make it look like a you know whatever you want to, for a specific target audience that is targeted towards people that look at it and can interact with it in the exact way that they expect, um, just like you know the DSL they've made. All right, so. Basic idea. So I have a code example here at the right, which is pretty much a non-optimal dual-threaded um, sum kernel. I just want to sum up the two values in the array and walk you through this real fast so it's easier. It's very simple. So I have these two data arrays and I fill it up with something. And then I want to put all the sums of you know index you know, 0, 1, 2 from the you know, pairs in the arrays there. And I want to put them in the output here. And I want to use two threads. Um, so I had to write a lot of code for this. And that to me is a lot of code. I, for something as simple as summing up two numbers with two threads, you should never do that by the way, sum up just with threads, it's horribly inefficient. But um, for example purposes, it's great. So if I'm doing this and I'm writing out all the code for it, that's a lot of code for such a simple operation. That took, well, honestly it took like 10 minutes, but still that's you know, more code than I really wanna write. And then if I wanna go to five threads or 10 threads, now I have to put those in a for loop. And then as I mentioned, if I want to go to a process or fibers, now I got to rewrite it again. And then if I want to ship it off to a GPU again, that's yet another version of my code. I don't want to do that and I want to get away from that. And so I would say that this code is not scalable despite the, you know, some, you know, let's just not look at the fact that we're only summing. But thread, or threaded code like this is not scalable in heterogeneous devices in my mind without significant porting and reworking. All right, so yeah, just in case you wanted to see the simple sum function, like I said, this is inefficient to do on a thread, but it makes great examples. All right, oh, that didn't show up very well in the colors. Okay, so basically, um, this guy that you know did a lot of papers on virtual memory or folding, automatic folding in the 60s, had several position papers, and basically he's like, guys, we're shooting ourselves in the foot by making our code where we have to rewrite it over and over and over and over again. And this guy was at IBM Yorktown in 69, and basically said, okay, let's make this automatic folding hardware. Right now it's less efficient, but you know what? In five to 10 years, it's gonna be optimized and relatively efficient. And so that's why we have virtual memory today because this guy went out on a limb and said, okay, let's adopt it. And so I'm kind of saying right now we need to adopt some kind of programming paradigm or hardware paradigm that makes efficient heterogeneous programming easier. Otherwise we're just gonna be, well, we're all coding in Java within like a few years, but we'll see. Um, okay. Yeah, um, nothing against Java, I like Java, but um, okay. So basic idea, so I have that sum function, which again, I said was bad. It's a bad example, however, it's simple. And simple is exactly what I want to walk people through this. And so this is an example with a raftlib kernel. And this is the first time we've actually gotten to any raftlib code outside of my initial example. And so I'm gonna walk through this relatively quickly because we're gonna go in depth later on. So first, I have this kernel, which is just a class and it extends you know, via inheritance raft kernel. And then I have this cool virtual function, which does my actual work and summing. Um, but then the innovation here is I'm adding ports. And so each one of my kernels, remember before on that sum function, I take in two of my numbers, you know, index zero and index zero from both arrays. I add them together and I send the result to my output. This is doing the exact same thing, but I'm um, restricting the inputs and the outputs via my ports. And so I know exactly where the data is coming from every time. And yeah, this is a little bit of a verbose example. I could have made this a lot more compact, but I think this is easier to look at. And so I have you know, a pop of my ports, which there's easier ways to do this within Raftlib. But again, it's easier to look at. So I get my values from both of these input ports. I allocate memory on my output port. I do a zero copy um, for my return value of A plus B. And then I return proceed because, well, I'm not finished yet. And the beauty of this is because I have this port interface, and I'll go in depth in just a little bit. But because I have this port interface, I know when this kernel is not gonna get any more data because I know when the functions ahead of it in line are done. And so the runtime can say, hey, there's no more data coming. When this guy's done, shut it down. And so no matter what this one proceeds, when the data is done or when the job is done, this you know, function's going away. And if data ever reappears, it can pop back up, which is kind of cool. 
All right, so what does Raftlib actually you know, look like when I want to compose an application? Um, again, this is high level, we're going to go in more depth. Uh, so I get fewer co uh, lines of code overall, but when I want to hook my application together, so before I had those arrays, I had array A and B. Instead of you know, making an array, generating the data to fill my array, and then using the data, I've just created random generator kernels with a specified number of outputs, which is basically what I did to fill my array. So it's the exact same uh, problem or exact same application. And then I have my sum kernel, which you just saw, and then I have a print kernel, which is defined within Raftlib. It's one of the utility functions. And they have this thing called a map. Um, yeah, I realize after the fact that you know map might be a little bit too overloaded with standard library, but it makes sense for Raftlib to have a map that you're putting your uh, directed graph into. And so it stuck with it, and well, it's in the namespace, so it won't really cause any problems. So let me walk you through this real fast. So I have my generate functions A and B. I don't know why that's in a different color, but that's okay. So I have generate A, streaming data to my sum kernel, or uh, sum kernel. I have B, streaming data to my sum kernel. And you see here, I specify a name, and that name specifies my input port. And so that's how I tell this one to link to this one. And if I only have a uh, single output port, I don't have to specify any name at all for the A. And so it automatically links it. And so when I hook these together, um, it looks really simple and like I'm not really doing much, but with a stream operator, I'm actually creating a uh, memory um, linkage between one kernel and the next. And so I now have a way to communicate from here to here and from here to here. And then on the sum output, both of these have you know, a single output port and this has a single input port, so it's very simple. And then when I hit EXE, I decide where I'm gonna run this, whether it's gonna be a thread, whether it's gonna be a fiber, whether it's gonna be a process. That's all decided at runtime and based on the hardware I've got and you know the environment. And once that's decided, then I can decide what kind of memory gets allocated for this. Whether it's gonna be you know, shared memory on the heap, whether it's gonna be TCP link, whether you need to you know, allocate it for an accelerator, that's all decided by the runtime and it's all done by the runtime. And there's lots of uh, intricacy and complexity inside the allocation mechanisms, which we'll get to towards the end if we have time. And if you know not enough people walk out the room, then we'll start going to more depth, but hopefully they won't walk out the room. Um, but the cool thing is, if you saw on this slide, um, one thing that's absent is injected state. And so what do I mean by injected state? So I see in a lot of parallel code that has bugs, um, global variables. And so it's really common to inject things from outside. And so Within the Raflib, one of the you know, guidelines if you're going to use the library is don't use global variables and don't inject outside state. Because the state encapsulation that we have with Raflib gives us a lot of nice properties. And that allows us to scale out to all kinds of interesting heterogeneous devices. Um, so this is just a you know, toy interface at the moment. But one of the projects I worked on as a grad student was uh, Autopipe, a horrible name. Yeah, don't, you know, I'm not going to argue there. but um, Autopipe allows you to build a directed acyclic graph and communicate between CPUs and FPGAs pretty seamlessly. So it's pretty nice. And so, you know, in the back burner, I had this whole, hey, let's reinvent the FPGA interface. And so I can keep the same port interface that I had for my C program or C++ program that I've specified. I can specify my types. And that's all the runtime needs is to know what the input ports are and the output ports are. And then, the cool thing is, I can take this, which if anybody's familiar with VHDL, is just a VHDL sum block. And so this is something I could run on an FPGA in hardware and do this completely in parallel and ship it off to my FPGA device and then ship the data back. And I can do that without changing this at all, which is kind of wonderful. Um, so the runtime can actually do all the scheduling, partitioning, placement, and everything else work behind the scenes. And we've got a lot of instrumentation that does that sort of thing. Um, but that is, you know, to me, really cool. I mean, I kind of like it. So now, instead of standard thread, I just have kernels. And instead of CUDA memcopy or whatever, I have these little stream operators. And yeah, it makes things much nicer and simpler. So with that, make sure I got everything in that slide. Yep. And then the other thing I'm working on is a uh, OpenCL interface and eventually a CUDA as well. Um, so we can start shipping stuff off to GPUs. I haven't decided whether we're gonna make all that fully open source, but we'll see. It also depends on things like FPGAs, if you're familiar, require synthesis tools and other licenses, and so it's not as portable as things like OpenCL. 
So that plays into the making it open source. So again, key encapsulation is, you know, or the key of Raftlib is state encapsulation. So everything is hooked into my kernel. So when I'm composing my application, if I have a library of kernels, all I have to know is this is a sum and it takes these inputs and has this output. And I can link together some hellaciously complex topologies with just a few lines of code. And that same topology can run on all of my heterogeneous devices. And then it's a pretty simple matter of partitioning and deciding how to optimize the overall uh, you know, actual running application. And then the scheduler becomes simple as well. And so the scheduler for each one of these kernels all it really has to consider is, hey, is there data on the input port? Has, have all of my upstream compute kernels exited already? If so, wait for no more data, and then, hey, exit. If I do have data, then I can run. Yes, question. Uh, what about slow joiner uh, problem? If the, if the consumer starts up too, too late? Oh, so if the... Con or if what, the uh, what happens to the data in the pipeline? So the data in the pipeline is still going to be there. So I mean, if the producer is continually producing data, the data is not going away. It is still going to be sitting in whatever buffer construct. And yeah, I say FIFO, but it's not always actually FIFO. It just looks like one. Um, the data is going to be there. And so it, when the consumer joins the party, and this happens a lot with distributed applications, um, the data is going to be available and you're going to connect on and start streaming in. And the other thing, which is a uh, you know, corollary to that question, so it's actually nice you uh, asked that one, um, is how you handle, say, persistence and or um, things like RDD or um, backup of your data. So once I start getting into uh, distributed applications, um, being able to handle redundancy is actually pretty critical. And so the FIFO actually makes a nice um, construct for that one as well because you can actually copy offline um, the data in the FIFO before you start shipping the data off and it basically provides a, a nice image and backup copy. And so with a distributed system, if I was gonna start it up late on another uh, end, you know, the data is there. If it dies, I can just restart another one and hook it up and go. Another question. Do you also have like different patterns? So you have one to many and many to one and many to many. So the question was, do we have uh, different patterns, one to one, many to many? And the answer is yes, we do. And that question's also loaded and slightly complicated. Um, so there's one to one, one to many, and there's also um, static variations and dynamic variations. Because I found as we're building applications, I don't always know how many consumers I need. For instance, I need a way to add um, more, let's see if I get a good example here, I can back up. All right, so I will in a few minutes. Um, I don't always know how many, you know, I want to add on for various, uh, you know, hardware architectures. If I have 48 cores and they're not being used, and I can go faster, I might as well use them. And so we can expand out and contract when needed. Um, any other questions? I've been kind of flying by, hopefully I'm putting by to sleep. All right, no more questions, awesome. All right, so I've mentioned this uh, state encapsulation problem, and I was hoping there was a simpler solution to it. And so as I started looking at going distributed, I noticed that um, there's not really an easy way to find out <laughs> um, without modifying the C++ language itself, how much external state is injected within my class, especially with a virtual class and subclasses. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's really a huge problem. If, say I want to move this kernel and it has this global variable which is in the process space of one process and I want to move it to say another node and hook them together with a TCP link. As soon as I start this one up on the other node, I'm gonna get a seg fault because this doesn't actually exist or it exists, but it exists with the wrong value. So that's a problem. And so my first hack solution, um, if I ever get time, I'll hack it in and see if it actually works. Um, is say a pure keyword for the class. And so you could have pure virtual classes that say, I have no injected state except for my parameters. And you'd have to make an exception for the ports. So any questions on that one? Or better suggestions? Because better suggestions are always nice when you're talking about adding in to a language. Additions are always bad, usually. No suggestions, okay. Moving on. So yeah, we link stuff together and we've talked about one-to-one -one and one-to-many uh, configurations. So how do we put these applications together? So you've seen this um, in abstract, and basically it gives me this. And so I have two kernels, connect one to the next. And then I can run these anywhere. They can be in processes, threads, yeah, okay. Um, I think we got that. Okay, specifying ports to link to. 
So what if I have, say, five output ports on kernel A? And we've wrapped up the off names. I need to specify that. And so we've overloaded this bracket operator to say, hey, this is my output port. And again, this is context dependent because it's a DSL and it's got its own language characteristics. And this is my output port. And this one only has one input port. And so I know it'll link Y0 to B when I hit execute. OK, now we need to make more interesting topologies because when you're starting to do real apps, these um, aren't enough. OK, so yeah, I said this bracket operator was context dependent. Well, it is. And so if it's on the right side of this uh, right shift, then this means the input ports for B. And this means the output ports for A. And so I want to hook Y0 to X0 of kernel B and then make this link right here. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? I see nods around the room. I see one kind of quizzical look there. OK, no question, though. Perfect. OK, now we can extend this even further. And again, I said it's a DSL, and everything is uh, context dependent. And so if I have this guy in the center, um, let's say this we know is what kind of port? Is this uh, input or output? Output. output, OK. And now we have B, and it's in the center. And I have two here. All right, what do we do? Let's see how intuitive this is since I haven't actually told anybody yet. So what is this one, do you think? Yeah, okay, and so what is this one? Perfect. I didn't think that was gonna actually be that intuitive, but. There is the picture below. Oh, I know, but. <laughs> Let me feel good about myself for a few minutes, come on. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so we have this, and these are context dependent. And so we have output, input, output, and input, and we can continue on chains like this over and over and over. And what this enables us to do is make really crazy, awesome pipelines of applications. And so all these can execute you know, in parallel or sequentially, however the runtime decides to optimize them. And it's one of the other fun things is you can you know, hack Raftlib and put whatever scheduler backend you really want to. They're all kind of modular and separate. In fact, the file is actually called schedule.hpp and then you have an interface to implement. So. All right, um, more, reducing duplicate code. So this is another pattern you find, say, OpenMP, pthreads. You have a uh, you know, split reduce um, map join type paradigms. And so what I want to do is have an easier way to specify that. And so I probably, and this is the one a lot of people crab about, took these operators and said, OK, this one kind of looks like a split. That's perfect. This one kind of looks like a join. Awesome. And so I overloaded them. And now we have the ability to split and join automatically. And the one thing I didn't put in this picture, which I should have, is A is assumed to have three output ports, and C is assumed to have three input ports, all of the same exact type for this um, example. And so what we get with this one little bitty line of code, something that looks like this. And so the runtime automatically duplicates B as many times as we have input ports and connects it here and here. Um, there's all kinds of runtime checks, of course, that happen. You know, you check the types, check the reports. This one has to equal the number of this one. Otherwise, you th uh, throw a runtime exception. And yeah, it works. It's nice. And that way we get a split join. And it's also pipeline parallel in addition to our split join, which most people don't go, if you're writing pthread code, most people only do this. They don't attempt to run these two in parallel as well, just because it's insanely complex to actually start data here, stream it to here, here, and here, and stream data here, and then join it all in independent threads because now I have all the extra you know, locking synchronization to manage. So most code you'll run into never even gets this parallel, but now we can do it simply with just these lines of code. So yes? How should I reason about this since the direction of the arrow is not the direction of the ah. output? Yeah, so the direction of the arrow here um, this is simply meant to symbolize within the uh, DSL as a split. Um, yeah, so you could have potentially overloaded some other operators, and I do agree the uh, directionality is different, but pay attention to the directionality, the open and the close. Yes? If on C you wanted C1 and C2, and then they merge in, so you got kind of a hierarchical thing. Yes. What do you do? So if I wanted C1 and C2, so you can actually um, embed these as many times as you want. So you're going to have two of these. So I can have A, you know, go to B, and then I can close that into C, then I can close that in again. Um, 
And to answer your question, uh, to embed hierarchies, all that's really required is changing in the nesting. And so I change the nesting, change, um, change basically my embedding structure of my hierarchy. All right, so any other questions before I move on? This is the one that gets a lot of people. No? Okay. So after I started porting apps, which, you know, as a runtime developer, surprisingly, you spend a little bit of time, you know, on the runtime after you have it, and then you spend a lot of time making benchmarks to prove people that it works, and test cases to make sure all the individual features work. Um, but as I was looking through various benchmarks, I realized my simple split joins were simply not enough. Because a lot of times I have this pattern here too. And I talked about this last year at CPP now, and that I was thinking about doing something like this. Um, and I hesitated because yet another, you know, container data structure, do we really need one? Um, well, in this case, I decided I actually did. Um, and it has to do with the way we're actually doing the port type checking. Um, if you want to ask about that afterwards, we can. Um, but basically this enables us to do a split and then a join with heterogeneous um, ports in the center. And so the order that we're invocating these here, so B, C, B is gonna to go to the first port that you've defined in A, C is gonna to go to the second port, and then the center ones are assumed to have one activated input and an output port. And I guess the keyword there is activated, because you can also do, can everybody see the bottom there? You may have to stand up, okay. So you can also do something like this, if you have not just a single input and output port on the center kernels, I can activate my input port and output port that I want to specify for this particular K set. And then what the K set actually gets us is it checks to ensure that I only have one activated port for this entire set going across. And then it ensures the order of joins for the A when I connect them together. Um, and again, that's you know one of the reasons I came up with another container versus just using standard ones. Any questions? Yes. You could simply, so the question was, what's the advantage of um, grouping these together um, like this versus um, simply doing it manually? Um, one, it's you know harder to read in my mind. Two, um, fewer lines of code here. And then three, if I'm, as uh, this gentleman stated just a second ago, if I wanna have a really um, embedded nested pipeline, as in if I have multiple levels of these, I can do something like that much simpler with this construct and these operators rather than manually constructing that over, say, 40 lines of code. And next question. Uh, would, we, would you be able to run B and C on different kind of hardware, like uh, C on the GPU and B on the CPU? Yes. And so the question was, can I run um, B and C on different hardware and say these, uh, the trick is within Raftlib, these are all independent. And again, all the state is encapsulated, so as long as I have an implementation or a means to actually get to that implementation. And what I mean by that is I have to have code to run on the device. And so if I have a GPU implementation of, of say, the SUM application and the kernel interface that matches for Raftlib, um, I don't want to go back that many slides, but if I have the implementation of the ports to tell the runtime that I have two inputs and one output, and then a GPU implementation that matches, yes. Um, the, that's you know registered with the runtime, and I can you know run that on whatever device. And so this could be independently running on a GPU, and this could be independently running on a CPU, and then they'll all be synchronized at D on whatever device D is actually running on. So next question. Yeah, I'm still uh, not trying to get my head around about the uh, the split thing. Is that let's say A produces a sequence of values, and then the first one goes there, and the second one there? Or is it like, okay, A produces pairs of values? And so this depends on the implementation of A itself. And so the idea here is that the application developer can say, build a kernel that, okay, let's use, um, oh, what was a good one? So let's use the uh, RGB to CY chroma, I can't remember the other one, converter. And I have a stream of color channels that I wanna split out. Um, I as a developer can split those out in this kernel and then have a zero copy to B, C, and you know pretend there's a D down here and this is E, and process my three channels separately without even moving the data and doing zero copy, and then send the data to D if I wanted to. And again, that's application dependent. So if I'm putting this together, I need to know 
how I want to construct my application, whether it's sending a stream of data across all the ports, sending it round robin. And then the other thing the Raftlib library provides is a set of uh, split and joined kernels that have um, you know, round robin, uh, first in, first out um, type uh, schedulers for data going across. And so if you wanted to use one of these fixed paradigms, you could, in fact, do that um, very simply by just hooking in a block to do it for you. Next question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, Keep going. I, I worked in that domain, not, not as an expert, but we were generating code for a different library, but that's similar things. It's that, fun, isn't it? I'm, I'm <laughs> to, to compare. Yeah. Uh, is the, <clears throat> the map that you're building, is that, uh, once you build it, is that static, or do you also provide kind of a dynamic uh, routing based on load or stuff like that? So it is, um, so the initial work that I did as a grad student way back when, um, on the autopipe system was completely static. Raftlib took an entirely different direction. Raftlib is fully dynamic. So everything is um, runtime. I can add kernels, I can remove kernels, I can add ports, I can add edges, um, I can move stuff, I can even change out the underlying type of memory if something else comes available. Um, so yeah, orchestrating all that at runtime without exceptions is kind of fun and interesting, but it is, again, completely dynamic. What about FPGAs then? That's um, one thing I'm working on currently is how to ensure that um, happens dynamically. So one thing I've been playing around with is uh, bit file changing, um, and so that limits you to a fixed set of hardware. Um, and I, yeah, the question you have is interesting because, yeah, apparently you're very familiar with FPGAs. So FPGAs, for the audience's uh, sake, are very hard to do things dynamically with. And so if you want to swap out functions at runtime, you have to have what's called a bit file to specify the hardware, the gates, configuration ahead of time. And I have to have this stored on my device, otherwise it creates all kinds of havoc. Um, and so the command structures I'm working with right now basically say, okay, I want to specify this type of kernel on the device, reconfigure your gates, go. And then if I want to specify a different type of device, I have to go change and reconfigure the gates. So there's a little bit of delay. And again, um, the FPGA interface is still very, I wouldn't even call it alpha at this point. Um, I, I can point you to some open source library that my project colleagues did on that. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah um, so yeah, let's definitely talk after the uh, presentation. That'd be, uh, probably save me several weeks and months worth of work. <laughs> they worked a couple of years on that already. Oh. <laughs> it's probably far more stable than what I've come up with in a few weeks and months. Uh, next question. On the previous library, is that the 3D build center? Um, yes. Did that, does it give so, in your sum example, you were summing up 120 values. Is it sending like 40, some of them to the A, first B, and well, splitting to the third, or how is it splitting that? Okay, so the question is um, within this, so if I have A, um, just for the camera, and I want to split this out, how is A actually determining what goes to which port? Um, okay, so let's put a pin in that question and hold on to it because I think I got a perfect slide for you in a few, uh, few slides. Any other questions on the related stuff right here that I can hit? One. When the last line of code finished, it, it, it's like synchronous execution. So you have the result in D. So when the, the slide, actually, yeah, so let's go to this one. Yeah. Okay, so when the last line of code is executed, so the exe function, which I'm not showing in this slide, do I have it on any of the other ones? No. Okay, so the exe function is basically a barrier. Um, and there's other barrier functions within Raftlab that you can wait on the output of any one of these kernels. And in that way you can interact with say like the standard library and puts off in like a standard vector um, and actually hit, be confident so, that the so results are finished. This but is asynchronous, right? This is completely asynchronous and I have to wait for it all to be done. So, mm -hmm. Unless I add barriers on specific kernels and say I want to wait for this one to load up my standard vector to operate on something else. Which I found is quite useful when porting code that uses standard library. So, Any other questions? I have to move on. Yeah, sure. Ooh, that's a really good question. And actually, I've got another slide on that one in just a little bit. So let's hold that one again. So the question was for the camera, um, could this be like 30 threads, five threads, or you know what? And we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, okay, so more complicated example. It's fairly obvious once we start embedding this with our DSL that we could actually extend it out to even more complicated stuff. Whereas this one, I've got a split. I've got a, a stream operator connecting B to C. And I've got another join. And so I can embed these, give an appropriate uh, parenthesization, so make sure I follow my ordering rules for my uh, special operators. Um, I can construct something like this with just one line, which is kind of nice. Yes? How do you, do you have to put 
doing a lot of clinical sweeps, because I'm not sure what the well, like operator precedence. Yeah, so that actually comes into play once you start getting past this point, which is actually why I chose this simpler example versus a very long chain example. Because if you start chaining, you know, say 40 of these and you have multiple uh, less than equal to and then right shifts, you actually start having to worry about operator precedence and then you actually start having to worry about the uh, parentheses and specific spots. But if you stick to something like this, then you're not gonna have to worry about it. Um, unfortunately, the way C++ is constructed, there's really not a good way to get around that at the moment. Um, okay, so I'm gonna have to fly on these. Okay, so this is one of the other cool things. So with streams, so IO streams, you have uh, stream manipulation operators, right? So I can say standard hex and it comes out as hexadecimal. So I thought, hey, that'd be kind of cool if I could just do something like that and change the nature of my streams. Um, so way back when we had this um, on the original um, Raftlab interface and in a function call, and now you've added it in the stream. And what this does is it gives me an ability to say, I have a single entry and single exit uh, point with which I can take kernel P and the runtime doesn't really have to care about the order of the outputs or inputs because I'm telling it it's explicitly out of order from this point to this point. And you can do multiple nests of those as well. And the run runtime can determine single entry, single exit based on the DSL formation. And so I can parallelize the heck out of this. You know, if I have 48 cores, I can use 48 cores. If my system is, you know, resource constrained, I can actually shrink back down to say, you know, five. Um, does that make sense? This one actually loses a lot of people. So, no, all right. And we have only one um, output port on A and one on C. However, um, what's not shown is this one's actually constructed from a special uh, raft kernel, which is a uh, parallel kernel. And so if you extend the parallel kernel versus the standard kernel, it automatically tells the runtime that I can take the parallel kernel and add dynamically as many ports as I want to at runtime. All right. So. What I had the realization after I did all this uh, stuff was I just built a giant boilerplate manufacturing machine. It just, you know, chunks the code in the right places, puts all the resource allocations, invocations, everywhere they're supposed to go. But um, I realized I'd be a little bit hard on myself. There's actually a lot more to it than that. There's lots of partitioning schemes, allocation schemes. Um, there's actually a lot of queuing theoretic stuff with a lot of fancy math we're not going to go into. Um, there's a lot of stuff under the hood that optimizes the application for us. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into a few of the low, lower level details. But starting at a high level, so everyone doesn't fall asleep. So how many people think they write, you know, memory code that looks like this, as in buffers and, you know, queues? Everything goes to the right spot, it's all, yeah, okay, we got one person. Everything goes to the right spot, it's all nicely labeled, bundled, and easy to look at and read. And the problem is, I mean, even my stuff, you're looking at it, you know, someone else, it makes perfect sense to me, but you give it to someone else. Unless you have very tight coding standards, they're not going to know what the heck they're looking at. It's going to look something like this. Um, about that one. Say again. I, I thought you were asking. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah no. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, like you know, me myself, I kind of think everything looks like that. But in fact, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's one of the cool things that Raflib actually does for us is it gets rid of a lot of the uh, spaghetti code with all the um, buffers and memory allocations that go all over the place. It organizes them into, you know, what amounts to the DSL stream operators and fork operators and join operators. It makes things much simpler. Um, yes, we're taking some of the control out of the user, but one thing that we're adding back in, let me go to this one, is within the beta that's uh, currently, in, well, currently in the dev branch and not yet pushed because still not totally complete to my satisfaction. But when they are adding are a lot more stream manipulation operators. And so you can specify things like, I want non-volatile for this. I want, uh, you know, fast low latency memory. Or um, as came from one issue, I want to be able to specify the size of my buffer between these devices. Um, this particular individual was uh, web scraping and noticed that the buffer continually, you know, grew the faster connection that he had. <laughs> which, yeah, it did. Um, and so now we can specify exactly with this, the size and the number of you know, type items that you have um, within the stream. So that's a nice feature and something I wouldn't have originally thought of. So as we start you know, getting more and more users, we you know, refine the library, which is I think the usual course of things. Um, let me go forward to this one and this one. There we go. So allocation at a high level, you know, first thing, it's kind of obvious. Make sure you actually have ports to hook to. 
Second thing, make sure they are type uh, matching. Um, originally, I considered and will eventually get back to that um, to where the types can be convertible. Um, but right now, the types are matching. So if I have ints on one side, it's got to be ints on the other. Otherwise, you'll throw a runtime error. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Mostly, it's uh, performance as opposed to correctness. So yeah, next thing, you're actually going to start allocating memory. Um, but to do that, you got a few more steps. So yeah, the links, the stream operators, what goes in between there, you're accessing it with something that looks like a FIFO, but it's not always a FIFO. Um, if you're at my performance talk yesterday on FIFOs, you'll uh, notice that I said 64 bytes is kind of an interesting uh, you know, stopping point for a lot of these structures and changing around which type I actually use. And so the first step in actually deciding what kind of allocation to have, I have a template that says, okay, what size is my type or each individual type that I'm going to be moving across my stream. And so that's the first demarcation. Second, do I have a constructible type or is it a non-constructible type? Do I need to call a constructor? So everything tries to minimize data movement, so everything is in place constructed on one of the streams. Um, does that make sense to everybody? I'm rolling through the last few slides really quick, so I got a lot to go still. Okay, so one fun thing about Raftlib, which is actually what I did my thesis on, was how to automatically change the buffer sizes while the thing is running and how to do that with a mathematical certainty. Um, this is not always obvious why you want this, but Raftlib does it for you anyways. And so when you have even you know, rate matched you know, producer and consumer pairs, you might think that, okay, this buffer of size one is always gonna be perfect. Let me throw this at you. So I have an assembly line with two workers. My first worker has a break schedule that say, you know, every 15 minutes he takes a five minute break. He hops off the assembly line. He's not sending anything to worker B anymore. My second worker has a break that's 30 minutes. That's on every 45 minute interval. So he's not picking stuff up for that break, but it's at an odd interval to my first worker's breaks. So can anybody take a gander at what that's going to do to my buffer or the, you know, items or jobs that are in between those two workers? Yeah, it's going to explode. It's going to be really bursty periodically. And it's going to look like, it's actually one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> um, so this is perfectly exponential. And theoretically, uh, both the producer and consumer pairs here are actually rate matched. They're actually operating at the exact same rate. But the problem is because of the bursty behavior, whether one gets you know scheduled off or one has an interrupt called on it, um, you're going to get behavior like this, even if you, you know, are very, very conscientious in how you arrange your application. And so to get maximum performance from the producer and the consumer, that buffer needs to be bigger or smaller. And determining the exact size of the buffer can be done using queuing network models, but that's, you know, requires some complex math. But, you know, Raftlib actually does a lot of that for you, which is kind of nice. Um, one thing they haven't added back in is, say, service rate monitoring, which is something else that I did my thesis on, and we'll add that back in uh, soon once we get the uh, interface and everything stabilized. Um, okay, so I think that was pretty clear. Anybody have any questions? Okay. So, allocation at a low level. It's pretty obvious, right? So, once I have a port and I have a type for that port, to actually dynamically allocate the right type, the right size, and everything else, and to know whether it's constructible, the easiest and simplest way to do that is have factory objects, and so that's exactly what Raftlib does under the hood. And so if you see here, we have um, heap, we've got heap instrumented, we've got, um, no, they not put the shared memory ones on here. So we have yes instrumentation, no instrumentation, and it keeps going on and on like this. And so there's lots of allocator factory objects for that specific type, for that specific memory, and then special ones for instrumentation and no instrumentation. And then at runtime, because I have these alloc allocator factories already ready to go, you know, the code for them, you know, a nice little function. I can change out the type of memory at will, dynamically. As long as I obey the topology and keep my topology the same, the application's correct, but I now change out my memory for performance reasons. So I can allocate, if I have a special allocator, for instance, for non-volatile memory, I can move it to non-volatile. I can move it to my, you know, HBM if I have an allocation interface for that. So it's very versatile under the hood and where it can actually move stuff. Um, all right. Yes. So is, is it the, the user then that specifies, yeah, I, I want this? Well, the user doesn't do anything. Okay. 
<laughs> so the question was, what does the uh, user actually specify? And can the user say whether I want this? So the user doesn't have to specify what type of memory. Um, with the newer um, stream manipulation operators, we're going to give the user some flexibility in saying, I have to have this in non-volatile, or I have to have this in low latency memory, and then let the runtime figure out what is available and what is actually low latency, and then attempt to put it there. So, yeah, I'm thinking more in, in terms of... Um... Uh, for example, it, it, if something happens in the system so that the consu consumer is slowed down, mm -hmm. so the producers way faster, uh, do we grow in memory until we have death? It's not going to grow in memory until you have death. In fact, well, so the question is, do you continue to grow if you have a mismatched uh, rate on your producer and consumer? Right now, it is actually a hard-coded constant um, to stop. There's <laughs> some more um, <coughs> optimal ways to do this. Um, looking into those, just not on the... Uh, critical path right now. So cool. eventually we'll get to that, but no, it's not gonna continue to grow until it dies. Perfect. That'd be bad. And in fact, I mean, you'll hit user limits on Linux anyways long before you actually kill the system typically. Unless you use zero. Well, yeah, okay, and yeah, <laughs> get around it. But hopefully, no. Okay, any other questions? Oh, oh they have one over there, yes, sorry. Uh, There is. Yeah, and so the question is if the uh, rate of the producer increases or if the, yeah. So is there a way to add, say, more consumer nodes dynamically? Um, yes, there is a way to do that. And the trick is whether I have specified, let me go back to, I have to go back a lot of slides and then I'll go back quickly forwards. All right, so whether I've specified my kernel with something like this and whether I can safely do that or whether I cannot. Yeah, but actually, like, the number of B would be Yeah, the B number of B can actually expand and contract based on the rates of the producer here and consumer here, and also on the uh, memory characteristics here and here. Because what the runtime is actually doing is it's watching the queue occupancy between these, and once I add it back in, it's actually watching these service rates or approximating the service rates or true service rates of these, so it can actually get ahead of the uh, queue occupancy. So it can actually anticipate whether it's going to need more kernels, fewer kernels, bigger buffers, smaller buffers. So, all right. Fast forward to this slide, this slide, and this slide. Okay, so this is the next one. So this gets to that gentleman's question there. Um, indirectly, I guess. So last time when I was at CPP now, I talked about partitioning. So we're using the Scotch partitioning library, which is overkill. Um, by partitioning, I mean what do I run where? And so whether this is a, whether each one of these kernels are fibers, threads, processes, et cetera, I need a core to run it on. I, for maximum performance, I don't want to delegate that to the operating system because the operating system is notoriously bad at scheduling stuff. So I want to do it myself. So initially we were using the Scotch partitioning library. And that produced pretty good partitions, but again, it's overkill, it takes a lot of time, it's pretty heavyweight, and it didn't have all the features I wanted. We still have it. It's available as a plugin if you really want to compile it with that. But um, we found better ways. And so I mentioned fibers a lot. So initially I was rolling my own uh, fiber library. So doing all the assembly code for that, for every architecture I wanted to support. Um, how many people have maintained that kind of stuff? Like, yeah, okay, I got a few here in the audience. Um, maintaining assembly for fiber libraries is just a pain. And so if I want to go from one architecture to the next, I got to go redo the assembly, go verify, make sure it's all right. Then you end up with like stack bugs because C++ decided to allocate something somewhere you weren't expecting. Um, it, it gets interesting. And so Cindy National Labs maintains the QThreads library, which is a fiber library. And it's, they're using it as a backend for several of the uh, HPC libraries. And so at the front end, you might get like Cocos, Legion, or OpenMP, but on the back end, it's actually running QThreads, which is kind of cool. Um, but the other thing it does is it gets me a partitioning library that's lighter weight and meant exactly for what I wanted to do with it in the first place. And lo and behold, it also checks another box. Um, last time I mentioned I wanted to uh, incorporate a, a library called Hardware Lock, which is, if anybody's familiar with it, it's what MPI uses to figure out the hardware topology under the hood. So it's a basically a wrapper library around all of the lower level libraries. And so it can go down the PCI device tree. It can look and see what cache configurations you have, where your numinos are, and it'll figure out the connectivity of all of those. And so between the hardware lock library and QThreads, I can now use QThreads, have a built-in partitioner, and have a plugin, which is hardware lock, to figure out where all my hardware is. 
So that just saved me like a year of time, which is awesome. Um, but it also, yeah, I sound like a vacuum cleaner salesman. It also <laughs> fixed another problem. So partitioning. So one thing I found as a grad student is that the more we abstract stuff, um, the more people are ignorant. And what I mean by that is they're ignorant of the lower layers and they do really silly things that we didn't intend them to. And so by giving people uh, abstraction like a kernel and saying, hey, I can make as many of these as I want to, as small as I want to, and just go run them, I've done a very dangerous and bad thing. Um, this is a pedantic worst case, which I keep in my test case. It's one of the ones you have to run to compile it. Um, and basically it just has a loop here and we're gonna focus on, do I have a nice box? Yes, I do, awesome. So we're gonna focus here. And so what this is doing is we have a random number generator, which is hooked to an initial S and I'm taking that one and I'm streaming a thousand extra kernels. So I'm making a thousand kernels in a line. It's a huge long line of compute kernels. And all these things do, just, um, I didn't show S on here, but all S is doing is subtracting from the input and sending it to the output. Horribly inefficient. Um, I ran across some particle simulation code that a fellow uh, student um, had done that did something similar to this. And so that's why, I, you know, really before I released this, I wanted to have a good solution to be able to guarantee the nice simple abstraction will actually work all the time. Because with just threads, it's not gonna work. So what we've created here, unwittingly, is something that looks like this. A long giant stream of kernels. It's thousands of threads, if I just ran it as threads. Um, so I probably did these in the wrong order, but if I run this on my laptop, well, so I did this experiment two days ago, just for fun. And so I got down to 20% battery and then I had to plug in. And then I realized my system was unstable and locked up. And so luckily I had saved everything, but yeah, basically it was dead. And it never finished. It's never gonna finish just because the overhead of scheduling, moving the data around, it's very silly. With Q threads, I could run these as fibers on say four actual threads and it finishes in just, you know, a little bit under three seconds which is exactly what I want and what I would expect. And so that's nice, so I can, the user can make as many threads as they darn well please. My abstraction is safe and, you know, people don't have to worry about what it's actually being implemented on because the runtime can figure out, hey, this guy is being silly, let's not make a thousand processes or a thousand threads, let's do a thousand fibers. All right, so how much time do I have? Okay, man, I only have 20 minutes left. Okay, so let's do this. We can talk about the structure of this, or we can talk about the interface, like the pushes, pops. That's pretty standard. I mean, it's basically what we have is a uh, FIFO, and I can run through those um, very quickly, and then we can get to discussion, or we can just go through the whole thing slowly. Which would you guys prefer? Quick show of hands. Quickly through this and discussion, or normal speed through this and have a few questions at the end. Oh, which one do you want? Do you want to go through quick or slow? One more option. Which one? Quickly and then discussion. Okay. Um, so quickly and then discussion. So I will go through this as quickly as humanly possible. So this we've already seen. I can skip that. This I can pretty much skip since we know that this is a kernel and we're extending the raft kernel interface. And I just mentioned that we have the raft parallel kernel, which you can also extend to get the dynamic um, splitting and joining behavior. All right, so receiving data. We have all the standard functions that you would expect of a FIFO interface. You have your peaks, which do as you were copy. You can look at the reference here. We have a auto release um, object, which is basically a overloaded um, unique pointer type, which is basically just a safe pointer. Because once we pass back, say 14 references, which are reference wrappers, we don't have a way to safely like, you know, de reference count those. Um, okay, so moving right along. Um, Unpeak, I said we have auto resizing. Well. If we peak something, we've got to unpeak it for auto resizing to actually work, and I won't get into technical details for that. Um, recycle, we want to be environmentally friendly. So we want to free up um, data or free up memory that is on our input uh, stream so that somebody else can use it. So we can call recycle with one, two, three, or however many um, you actually want to do. Um, when I say lazily deallocate, and I'll get to a pedantic worst case in a minute um, that I actually introduced because of uh, something fancy I did that was fixing something else. Um, so dangling reference, this is actually kind of interesting and I don't think anybody caught this when I was going through the peak and passing my references. So um, if I have peak and I get a memory object, I have a reference, okay? And I wanna use that reference, do something with it, with my memory that's on my input stream, right? Um, okay, to actually get rid of it, I need to call recycle. Well, what happens if this recycle is actually reordered around this and me using it? 
well, I would have deallocated a live object that I was actually intending on using, um, worst case. Because if it was a constructed object, when I hit recycle, eventually, you know, if I just did this stupidly, I would call the deallocate or destructor on that, and then data structures would be kind of ruined, and I'd have to move on. Um, the other worst case is if I have dynamic memory that was allocated inside this reference here, and then I have um, huge memory leaks. Um, so we ended up actually having to implement, um, which is part of the reason the beta is delayed, is we actually had to implement a garbage collection on our streams. And so now we have lazy garbage collection for objects that are allocated in a giant memory pool. And if the object here is not passed on to an output stream, so I can take this object from my input stream, directly send it to my output stream, and the memory is actually never moved, which is kind of nice, because data movement, if you guys didn't know, is like the biggest bottleneck in just about all of our systems. It's not compute, it's just moving the data. And so we keep the data that is in mem, same exact spot, and then I'm just moving it around. And then the garbage collector figures out whether that is still in fact a live object. And if it is, I don't kill it. And if it is a dead object, then I can go ahead and re or deallocate it. Um, receiving data, we have exactly what you'd expect. We have pops, which are basically um, not zero copy, it is in fact a copy. Um, then we have a pop range, so you can do multiple objects at the same time. This just makes it more efficient. Um, Sending data, which is the opposite side. We have allocate, which is a zero copy, so you're allocating memory directly in the output stream. Um, again, we have the fancy template size specification for which allocate you actually get, um, which is optimized for the size, and then we have the corresponding allocate range. Um, okay, so we have sends, which you have to send the data once you allocate it, because the runtime has to know, hey, I've allocated this memory, I need, I'm done with it, I can send it to my downstream compute kernel. So I have allocated memory, Put something there, send it. That is the paradigm that we're using. Does that make sense? And then of course, if I've allocated too much memory, so I've called the allocate in the previous slide, I need to deallocate it. Free it up for somebody else. It's akin to the recycle. I just couldn't come up with a you know fancy name for deallocate. Um, and again, you can have a parameter for that and deallocate more than just one at a time. Yes? How does all that work, allocation and deallocation? If you're saying different multiple processes? Um, the question is, how does all that work with distributed multiprocessors? Um, it works, it's complicated, and there's a lot of code and debugging time that went into making it work. Um, there's... So you divide the data? Do you share memory? How do you process it out? So... Attempted, it's easy, but what if I have big sequences as well? Yeah, yeah, no, and we can actually get into this um, in the discussion section. So if you saw the allocator factories, we have several different types of allocators are for each different type. And so if you're using shared memory, it's one type. If you're using the heap, it's another type. Um, and all these are passed around in type size um, objects, either from a pool of memory, which is a large pool of memory, and if you're going distributed and moving this from one kernel to the next, the memory is always passed around in a FIFO interface, so I know what memory the next compute kernel is going to need, I know where it's at, I know I can copy that memory from this you know, repository to my next distributed system or my next compute node, which is somewhere else. Um, and again, I can keep track of references and know who's actually touching it and what's live, what's not, which we do for the garbage collection. Have to keep track of what's live, what's not live. So, <coughs> does that partially answer your question? There's a lot of specifics that we can get into, but so I would... you're saying you're pretty much hiding it from the user, but you take care of it? Yeah, essentially we take care of everything. We're hiding it from the user because the user typically messes that up, in my experience. Um, <laughs> unless you're an advanced user, in which case you debug it once and you're usually good most of the time. Um, okay, so only have 15 more minutes and I really wanted to get discussion, so I'm gonna speed through this. So we have a set of um, non-zero copy push functions, which for primitive types, which uh, the gentleman just mentioned, um, you know, copying is, you know, almost as efficient as zero copying, oftentimes more efficient, um, simply just to push an int or a floating point value. Um, then we have the range insert, which you can use your uh, iterators to send data to your FIFO. All right, so yeah, We've implemented two threads. One thing that's also holding us up was um, writing a DSL with templates is, um, let's just call it fun. Um, so I, I wasn't satisfied or happy with the extensibility of my first um, template parser. And so I basically took it all apart and rewrote my entire LR grammar with templates. And if anybody's interested in the grammar, it's on the wiki page. Um, and so I rewrote the grammar. Um, it works, no reduce, reduce conflicts or shift reduce conflicts, which is nice. Um, so that's the latest, now we're getting that back um, implemented. Um, we've gotten a lot of wiki documentation and we've had a huge number of contributors, including some, one very nice person who actually ported it to Windows 10 for me, which is awesome. Just have the, you know, pull request. It's like, sweet. 
and lo and behold, it actually compiled. Um, okay, so um, yeah, slowly moving to beta, lots of issues, you know, going from alpha with something this complex to beta um, takes time. More users we get, and hopefully some of the folks in the audience will, you know, hop on, take a look at it, contribute. Code's not wonderfully, you know, well, some of it's pretty, some of it's not so pretty. Um, but as we beat on it and you know extend it, it's going to get better and better and better. And we're going to find more features that we need to add, some that we, you know, silly we need to remove. Um, looking at December, given my term, current uh, time frame, always looking for uh, extra contributors. We have an organization on GitHub, um, always willing to add anybody as a contributor, and that also includes being able to add yourself more contributors. So it's kind of like a uh, you know friendship letter. You just keep passing it on to other people, and hopefully we'll get more than you know just me and a few random people committing code, which would be awesome. Um, and I guess the other bit of news is I filed paperwork to start a uh, nonprofit to um, hopefully get more donations, add somebody, offer money um, to contribute. And it's like, well, you know what? I can't just take the check because the IRS isn't gonna like that very much. Um, so we went through the paperwork and started that process to file. So we're gonna be uh, doing that. And hopefully, you know, we'll get some more donations after that and we can start, you know, looking at hiring freelance people to start maintaining stuff and get actual cloud resources to do the continuous integration for us. And so, yeah, with that, I think that is all I had. And yeah, interactive portion, awesome. So with that, let's talk. Any questions for study? Yes. Can you share any uh, success stories of what uh, users are doing with this? Um, so the question is, can I share any success stories? So. Actually, a few of the example apps that are in the uh, repository resulted from people wanting to do, and in fact, these are uh, vision researchers, wanting to do use uh, OpenCV um, in a much more easy, parallelizable form. So they wanted to make pipelines out of it, and so image processing pipelines, and they're able to construct with Raftlib, you know, something in say, you know, a thousand lines that would have taken them, you know, ten or fifteen thousand lines to coordinate, um, which is quite nice to hear. Um, the other stories, I mean, people are making uh, web crawlers with it or uh, web scrapers. Uh, it was an example where we had to implement the uh, buffer sizing. Um, there's lots of other um, issues um, that have been, well, issues on GitHub, but people using it and saying, hey, can I do this and can I do that? Um, unfortunately, I haven't had time to get around to all of them, which is, you know, I wish I did, which would be great, but I just don't yet. Right, next question. Do you have any performance comparisons with like CRMQ or Nanomessage for both in process? and between processes? So I have performance comparisons for this and pthreads, and I actually showed a lot of those last time. I have another Black-Scholes example, because I'm going through the process. Anybody familiar with the um, uh, Parsec benchmark suite? So the question, just for the cameras, so the question was, do I have any performance comparisons? Um, yes, we do. And right now, they are between Raftlib and pthreads, Raftlib and OpenMP. Um, what Parsec is going to give me is Raftlib to both of those I just mentioned, plus Intel threading building blocks. Um, so yeah, again, runtime developer, yeah, 50% of my time nowadays, my spare time is porting applications that are benchmarks to this. And so eventually, yes, I will have more benchmarks, but it just takes time. Cool. So any other questions? We have oh. a control machine. Uh, we have a stream, TCP or UAP stream. So, repeat the question one more time. So, run across multiple machines. Uh, so, the question was, can I run across multiple uh, machines? So, that depends. So, we have an implementation of a TCP interface that, well, let's just call it functional. Um, so, right now, as part of the transition from alpha to beta, I'm in search of something that is better. Um, I've looked at RDMA libraries. The problem is those are all proprietary. That's actually easiest to implement with this. RDMA is remote uh, memory access, basically, or remote direct memory access. And that falls right into the shared memory paradigm because you, know, you can use it basically directly. Problem is, again, the proprietary. So what I've looked at was uh, CPP Netlib. I think that is probably my best candidate so far. Um, the other one is basically taking the uh, open MPI stack, which is the networking stack, and use that under the hood, uh, multi-node. So yes, it works multi-node. Um, no, it's not performant because it's basically creating a TCP stream for every single one of my ports and then using the buffers badly. <laughs> so that was something we implemented as a uh, grad student and that was actually one of my high school students, which is impressive for a high school student to implement that. Um, but it's just not um, production ready, shall we say. Um, and a question in the back corner, the green shirt, yes. I was uh, wondering, you said you 
have some benchmarks. Yes. How did Rafflib compare to so, OpenMP and Yeah, so the question was, so I had some benchmarks, and I, I'll, yeah, um, I don't want to close off the slides just yet. Um, so how did that compare between OpenMP and pthreads? So uh, the BZIP one is actually one we have a blog post about. It's a reported parallel BZIP, which was fairly optimized. I mean, somebody spent a lot of time putting together all the manual data movement between uh, queues and stuff. And so we actually bested um, parallel BZIP on you know, the scalability and the uh, execution time. And so that's a pthreads implementation. Then looking at, um, say, Black-Scholes, which is an OpenMP implementation, um, we're pretty much neck and neck all the way through on the data movement side until you start getting to the pipeline portions, in which case we start excelling. Just because the standard Black-Scholes application basically did a data fork parallelism versus a pipeline plus fork, and so we're actually getting more parallelism out of the application. Okay, so I had another question somewhere. Yes, sir. That's uh, open source? Yeah, I think it's Nessie or Nessie's actually built on top of their open source. Oh, awesome. I will actually go ask some of my friends. So the uh, you know comment was uh, Sandia has a open source or a, uh, at least open enough RDMA library that might be of use. And the question though in my mind is what hardware is it using for RDMA and how is it, uh, is it over TCP or is it over something else? Yeah. Yeah, the problem is a lot of those use uh, InfiniBand or RapidIO or one of the other uh, fancy, you know, behind the scenes. Um, okay, so the next question. Yes, sir. If you want to profile your code, how does that, does oh, that gets any fun. complexities there or nice? So th that, that depends on your definition of profile. So the question was, if I want to profile my code, um, is it fun, exciting, and nice, I think is the gist. Um, so if I want to use something at perf on this code, it's going to work just fine. So if I want to run Linux perf and just look at where the bottlenecks are, that's great. I can do that, and it'll show me exactly where my time is spent, just like any normal application. Um, if I want to profile the streams themselves, I don't have an external functionality for that yet. Um, that is um, one thing I want to do. And in fact, I actually want to have a GUI that shows what the current configuration is, and then you can have you know graphically where the bottlenecks are. Because the nice thing is about the you know DAG construction, basically, well, it's not always direct or not always acyclic. But one thing about the graph construction is I can have a nice graphical interface that shows my graph. How many times can I use graph in a sentence? But it shows my graph with you know the bottleneck, say in red or something, and I can decide, okay, maybe I need to split this kernel up or make it a little bit different. And that actually gets to one of the other criticisms I have of using a library versus a language, code motion. And what I mean by that is my kernel is fixed size. And so when I build a kernel, it has a fixed number of instructions in it. I can't, in a compiler, um, conservatively take that out and move that somewhere else. It has to be within that you know, function call, basically. Um, I, I had started building a language, as I said, initially, and that's one of the things that I enabled was code motion. But um, yeah, at my current rate of progress, would be like a decade or more before that's done. Somebody else will probably come and invent something far better. So. Um, yeah, so profiling to answer your question, you can use perf or something else, and within the next year or two, we'll have something that's much better for the uh, queue monitoring. So, so there would be a way. Sorry, there would be a way to query like uh, queue sizes or average queue sizes. Exactly. So the run, or the question was, will there be a way to actually uh, query average queue sizes and what the uh, queues actually look like, what the behavior is? So the runtime actually has knowledge of all that, um, and it's actually just adding taps that, say, an external monitor can look into. And so um, the intent is to provide, say, a shared memory interface or just a uh, file handle in a Linux virtual file system that I can open up to tap um, what the runtime can actually see for a particular application. So that's the plan, just haven't implemented it yet. So. Um, and yes, sir. So you had a very simple sample with just addition. What if I have, let's say, OpenCL mm -hmm. function kernel? Right? Yes which I have to compile, mm -hmm. put on GPU, then yep. send my data on GPU, run it, then maybe I want to keep my data there, send another kernel, and so on. So what would be the process in these terms of allocation, deallocation? So, so right now I haven't gotten to the multiple compute kernel in line in a row. And so if I have, say, compute kernel A, B, and C, and they're all running on the single, GPU, single so if we have a single one, that's actually fairly simple. The thing that gets complicated is, in fact, the make files. So actually getting the right compilers called and everything else with, say, CMake or uh, whatever. And at that level, it's not really that complicated. 
All I have to do is ensure that the right compiler is called for this particular file, the right header file is linked in within RAFTLAB, RAFTLAB knows about the pointer interface, it knows that there is a OpenCL implementation available, um, which that's specified within the uh, you know, kernel interface, which I didn't show you guys, probably should have. Um, okay, so there's a specification that the runtime recognizes that says, okay, I have an OpenCL kernel available, I have a C++ kernel available, and I have a VHD, uh, VHDL kernel available. And from those, I can choose where to run it. Um, and by choosing where to run it, I know exactly what type of allocation calls I need to have. And so it's gonna, well, in the GPU case, what's done right now is essentially, yeah, essentially is a double buffer. And so it's gonna make your output stream, it's gonna have a little small buffer space to write into immediately. It's gonna buffer it up so it's a bulk transfer to the GPU device, and then it's gonna call the GPU function after it copies the memory using whatever native GPU, GPU copy function it requires, whether it's CUDA mem copy or something else with OpenCL. Is that sufficient? Yeah. Uh, can I uh, can I pick as a user? Can I pick what what uh, what hardware I want to use? Um, so the question was, can you pick what hardware you want to use? Um, so right now, to answer your question, there is a way to specify whether you want to run it as a process or as a thread or something else. Um, I haven't gone as far as saying what kind of hardware you want to use because the interface for that, again, going back to the HCI perspective, of making it a simple easy to look at interface, specifying say, I wanna run this on a Intel E5 and I run, run this on my NVIDIA you know, K20. Um, specifying all those combinations gets interesting and ugly in a uh, runtime. And you almost have to use a string um, for each one of those specifications. And then doing that within the streams, I think is just kind of ugly and then letting the runtime do it seems much simpler. Although I agree with you, it would be nice for more advanced users to be able to specify exactly what hardware you have to run on. So that's a you know, fair criticism. Maybe consider adding that in yeah, the future. Two GPUs on my laptop. Yeah, Intel exactly. Nvidia, right? yeah. Yep, exactly. And it'd be kind of nice to be able to use one or the other mm -hmm. intentionally. Um, right now, if you turn off, say, your um, discrete GPU, say, in your laptop, it'll just run on your you know, Intel GPU, and, but uh, yeah. The worst case scenario would be to move to move all my data. To yeah, and you don't want to move it back. Yeah, you don't want to do that, so exactly. So fair, fair point. Any other questions? Yes. How often will you rotate? Suppose I don't want to use uh, any GPUs, I don't want to use any FPGAs, I just want multi threading and multi processing. It's actually the easiest. Few threads, right? Few threads are not available on every single thread. Well, not on every single platform, but I don't think it's available on React, it's not available on C. If you pick few threads, on other hand. Well, so that's um, so the question was, what happens if I pick a, uh, how portable is this? If I pick Q threads, can I move it to somewhere else? Um, so that's actually the beauty of using, say, shared libraries for this kind of thing. So when I compile it, I, you know, compile my shared library for, say, Q threads, if the Q threads is available for that platform. P threads is still implemented. Um, and so I can compile my library for P threads. And so when I start it up on that particular uh, machine or run that binary in that particular machine, the runtime shared library that it picks up or links against is gonna be a pthreads or a qthreads or whatever the current piece of hardware has for its shared library compilation. And so you should theoretically, and I say theoretically, um, still alpha stages, bugs could happen. You should theoretically get the right threading library for your platform. So as long as pthreads are supported there, which machine do you use for the Exactly. Windows XP? Windows yeah, so. Windows yeah, yeah, so somebody actually uh, implemented the uh, Windows equivalent of threads for uh, Camera, which actual API, um, but it works. On XP. Well, it works on Windows 10 so far as the only thing I've tested it on, so I haven't gone as far as testing on XP and 7, et cetera. Again, this is an alpha stage, one guy coding it. Um, <laughs> so we can't expect uh, production, you know, perfect, everything works in every possible system. Eventually we'll get there, um, which is kind of what I'm hoping by, you know, starting up a, you know, nonprofit container organization to get, you know, resources or extra resources for say, you know, cross-platform porting for lots of different combinations. So, any other questions? I think we're totally out of time, but go ahead. Uh, quick one. Um, so if you had a, a kernel that needed to do some sort of like windowed operation, it has to consume like, you know, tens of thousands of inputs before you can see the thing. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does that look, look like? You just keep saying like return to C. So, that's actually, uh, so the question was, um, if I have like a windowed operation and I want to consume, say, an exact number of items uh, before I can proceed. Um, so this is something we um, struggled with in the autopipe interface, and it's something I partially ignored in this interface because if you really wanted to, I can just continue to wait until there are 10,000 items available in my input port. 
And with the auto resizing, I'll eventually resize to the point where I have my 10,000 items and I won't need to resize anymore. Um, the long answer is I think there's a better solution via the interface for that. And I think providing a user basically a contract for that particular kernel on these particular input ports would give much better performance. So you can basically start off with the right size that's available. And then the scheduler... Well, exactly. And so that way, also the scheduler will never call that kernel unless that contract is actually met. And two, there's also lots of hardware things that we can do to optimize the scheduler, like um, Intel's mWait, or ARM has a set event, wait for event. And so you can actually, you know, say, wait for event or wait on this particular memory location or range of locations for, say, that 10,000 item marker to be uh, triggered. And so that would actually make a much more efficient scheduling mechanism. The trick is I'm uh, loath to do that until I come up with a nice, clean, pretty interface to do so. Um, again, it's about being elegant and simplistic versus making a whole bunch of boilerplate like we've kind of continued to fall into. So any other questions? All right, awesome. Thanks for listening to me.